All right, so now we're going to um, say a little bit about the issue of implicit versus explicit methods. So um, let's try to illustrate this in the context of the trapezoidal rule, which we were discussing. So you have a numerical method which says that the solution at the new time is equal to the solution at the old time plus the trapezoidal approximation of the integral of the vector field along a solution curve, right? So, <clears throat> and this is an example of an implicit method because the unknown y n plus 1 shows up on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And so in principle, you have to solve uh, it's this nonlinear equation in order to compute uh, y at the new time. Uh, in contrast, if uh, the method was explicit, um, this uh, right-hand side would only depend on things you already know, and so you could explicitly evaluate it. Um, so. Um, so again, it's like implicit methods. Um, sort of involve the solution of an equation in order to compute uh, the unknown. Okay, um, and this is in contrast to explicit methods. Can uh, be sort of directly <coughs> computed terms of known quantities. And an example of an explicit method might be the Euler method, uh, which is yn plus 1 is equal to yn plus h, uh, f evaluated at yn tn. And so uh, you can easily convince yourself that the unknown only shows up on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side involves things which you already know. Uh, and so you could evaluate the right-hand side without, uh, without any difficulty. It's like, and then compute uh, the solution at the new time. Okay, so you might ask, well, okay, in that situation, how do you go about uh, actually computing this? Um, so the question is, uh, Right, how to compute the update in an implicit method. Okay. All right. Um, so, of course, there are various uh, nonlinear root solvers, right? So you can use uh, sort of uh, some general class of nonlinear root solving, root finding. So uh, examples of these uh, might be um, bisection, right? Uh, Newton's method. The secant method. These are things uh, which you might have seen before. Um, and um, in practice, of course, um, it's uh, not uncommon to use Newton's method because of its uh, good rate of convergence. Um, together with the fact that when you are trying to solve it um, for the solution at the new time, uh, you oftentimes have a good guess as to what uh, that solution is because um, the previous the solution at a previous time is in some sense already close to the solution at the new time. Okay, so um, 
So one of the advantages, if you will, it's like you have, it's like when you're trying to solve um, for the update, um, in the case of a uh, time-stepping method in the context of numerical ODEs, is that you have a good initial guess. Okay, and this is not always the case uh, if you're dealing with a general root finding problem, uh, but it is certainly the case. It's like when you have um, sort of uh, a numerical ODE solver. Um, so I, I also want to talk about well more generally. Um, sorry, it's like I want to talk about uh, to what extent, uh, given the form, it's like of your. Um, numerical ODE method, it's like there, um, what other kind of approaches uh, you might bring to bear to this, okay? So, um, so let's look at that. So if you look at um, the form, for example, the trapezoidal rule, you'll see it has a, a very particular form to it. Uh, which is to say that the unknown which you're trying to solve for, uh, which is y at n plus 1, can be viewed as some sort of function of, uh, again, y at n plus 1, all right? So, uh, so you can write uh, this method uh, as the fixed point of some other function. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so if I write uh, y n plus one as um, some function g, which depends on y n plus one, right? Where g of x, okay, is equal to y n plus h over two, right? F at y n t n plus f at x comma tn plus 1, okay? So, uh, so you see that that right-hand side now of this function g of x, it's like uh, depends on x, which is the thing which you don't know, and then a bunch of other things which you know, okay? So you can think of that for the purposes of this discussion uh, as being prescribed constants. So y n plus 1, h, and the vector field, all these are prescribed constants. So you have some way of writing down then uh, the property that y n plus 1 satisfies the trapezoidal rule as the fixed point of some other map, okay? Um, and then essentially what happens then is that one way to solve um, for the fixed point of a given function is what is called fixed point iteration. So you can solve for a fixed point uh, using what is called fixed point iteration. Okay, so, uh, so if you want to find uh, g of x is equal to x, all right, then one way to do this is to sort of consider an initial guess. x equals to x0, and then uh, you use this, it's like to create an iteration method which says that xi plus 1 is equal to g of xi. So you're repeatedly applying, if you will, this nonlinear function uh, to, it's like uh, this sequence iterates to construct, it's like a sequence iterates. And so obviously if that sequence converges, uh, then it will converge to a fixed point of this. So that's, that's one way to, to think about this. Um, and the advantage, if you will, of fixed point iterations are that they're relatively easy to compute. Um, it involves evaluating the right-hand side. Um, but again, you might imagine that if your initial guess for uh, yn plus one is somehow good enough, then maybe you'll need a few number of iterations of this fixed point iteration in order to converge to a reasonable approximation of the fixed point. Okay, um, more generally speaking, what you want to show, it's like when you have these fixed point iterations um, in order to guarantee convergence is that this map uh, G here is in some sense a, a contraction mapping, uh, at least in a sufficiently small neighborhood, it's like of the fixed point, okay? So more generally, to 
improve convergence. point iterations you want to show that the map G is contracting okay and what it means it's like for G to be contracting is that if you look at the difference between uh, G applied to two different points, right? Then that difference uh, is bounded by uh, some constant C, uh, the difference between X and Y, and you want the norm of that constant uh, to be strictly less than one, okay? And so what that basically means is that if you have uh, two points which are near to each other, imagine, uh, and you apply this map G to it, uh, then that sequence of iterates uh, will converge, it's like, uh, to zero, which is uh, more or less what you want to guarantee convergence. All right, so, so in any case, it's like uh, if you have, again, the trapezoidal rule, uh, then one way to compute this uh, quite efficiently in the context of uh, numerical ODE methods um, is to use something like fixed point iterations um, where the initial guess might just be the solution at the previous time, okay? All right, um, so that's one possibility. Uh, another possibility, uh, uh, what are called uh, predictor corrector methods, um, which I'll talk about uh, now. So again, it's uh, the method which we have in mind is the trapezoidal rule y at n plus 1 is equal to yn plus h over 2. Let me just write this as fn uh, plus fn plus 1, just for uh, notational compactness. Um, but hopefully you understand what I mean by that. Okay, so, um, so what you could do, again, what's the problem is um, <coughs> you have here is that yn, it's like shows up on the right-hand side in particular um, with this uh, vector field at uh, n plus one term here, okay? So what you could imagine doing is you could imagine um, replacing this by some sort of approximation, okay? And then uh, perhaps by an explicit approximator, okay? So what you can do is you can use an explicit method Um, for example, uh, Euler, okay, to obtain a prediction let's call that uh, y tilde, okay, n plus 1. So y tilde n plus 1, of course, is uh, if it was the Euler method, would be y n plus h times f at uh, the end stage, okay? And then you use the predictor, it's like uh, in evaluating uh, this vector field at uh, the end point, okay? So, so the final method then is yn plus one is equal to yn plus h over two. Um, let me just write it down explicitly. f at yn tn plus f evaluated at um, Let's see, y n plus one tilde t n plus one. Okay. Uh, and uh, to make this explicit, uh, I'll write down uh, the predictor step as well. Okay. All right. So, so you have a method like this, uh, and then this method, of course, is. Uh, is explicit, it's not quite uh, the original method, uh, but there's a sense in which uh, you can oftentimes check that um, you can achieve the same order of accuracy um, as the, uh, the trapezoidal rule through this kind of uh, predictor corrector form. Okay, um, so this is, a, this is actually quite a popular numerical method in its own right. Okay, so it's uh, so there's sort of two ways of thinking about this. This is uh, 
is a popular method. In its own right. So uh, this is the classical uh, sort of second order explicit or go coulda method. And we'll, we'll study Rungu coulda methods uh, uh, more uh, as we go along. Um, or it's called Hoon's method. So these are again uh, some methods. It's like um, you know which you can obtain by uh, starting with um, these quadrature rule approximations of the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, and then um, sort of tweaking them in some way. So at, at this point, it's it's perhaps quite natural then to start looking at uh, numerical quadrature rules. Uh, so let me just stop here for now. It's like, uh, but the next thing we'll look at are how do you go about systematically deriving numerical quadrature rules.